Good afternoon. You must have all experienced this at some point. When you put your pack on and you've only been walking for five minutes and you know it's not loaded correctly. I've got the weight too high. It's uh, sort of wobbling about on the back. It's not particularly comfortable. But hey, never mind. I haven't got too far to go. Only about a mile at most. Um, this weekend, new toys to play with. I have a new tent. I have a new knife. But you won't see them until I get to camp. Because <laughs> I've got to get there first with a wobbly pack. <laughs> I'll see you in a bit. Right, tent is up. Miltech Recon 1. Nothing new. Been out years. Um, I've always liked the idea of one. Never used one. Picked this up second hand off a friend of mine. So, I thought I'd give it a go. Um, although it's got a low profile shelter, it's actually a little bit bigger internally than I thought. Um, I've got my Nemo sleep mat in there which is a generous size, it is about six foot long. And if I slide it one end, there's probably the best part of two foot at the head end. And of course, you've got a slope on the mesh on the inner and so on. So I want it roughly central. So my head and my feet aren't really touching to make the condensation any worse than it's gonna be. It's got three vents, but I still think I'm going to get some condensation, but it's not the end of the world. It's a cheap tent. It's just for fun. That's what it's all about. The other thing for testing this weekend, Zapaz, I think that's how you would pronounce it, made in Poland. Um, Ultra Outdoor. They've done this model for a while. But this is the toxic version. Um, stonewash blade, very deep grooved micarta handle. Um, this was supplied by uh, blades.co.uk for me to do a review. So I haven't paid for this, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, but of course you can trust me to tell you exactly what I think. If I like it, I'll say so. If I think it's rubbish, I will say so. After some testing today, we'll find out. Right, see what it's like splitting a pretty knotty and gnarly bit of ash. 
not a particularly thick piece, but well, to be fair, any thicker than that, you should be using a bloody axe. But uh, yeah, as a guide, I normally think wood up to about two thirds of the length of the blade. So you've got this little piece to knock down. Let's see what happens with this, because it is a nasty, horrible looking piece. <laughs> well, that was my answer. Did it quite well. I mean, it is, I can't remember exactly, just over four mil thick, I think. So it's a nice broad blade, which is what you want. You don't want a fine slicer. You want something that will force the wood apart, like an axe. Happy with that so far. Right, I've deliberately made the camera a bit on the dark side for this, so you can see the sparks. Is a, it's a decent fire still. I'll get good results from this. And my concerns are, although it's flat on the top here, it hasn't got a particularly sharp edge. And fire starting is something I use my knife for quite a bit. I know this isn't the right technique, but I'm do, gonna do it high so you can see the spark. Yes, it will. Just. Let's try the jimping. Hmm, not that impressive. For example, $4.99, made in China. That's the performance I expect. Now I can fix it. I can take a file or a grinder to the top and flatten it off. But really, for a decent sort of higher end or at least mid-range knife we are talking 100 pounds i would expected that from the factory right that's my thoughts so far um, obviously i'll know more after this trip it seems well built it's certainly tough enough um, it's 58, 59 on the Rockwell scale. I like the handle, although it looks fairly aggressive. It's it's comfortable and you know fairly non-slip, so that's okay. Um, the only thing I've found so far that I don't like is its fire steel performance, and that's because of this spine. But that is something I can hopefully sort out myself. Um, the only other thing, it comes with a Kydex sheath. Personally, I'm more of a traditionalist. I prefer a leather sheath. Uh, but this is, you know, it's well made. The uh, retention is good on it. I might get to like it. Who knows? But there'll never be a replacement for a proper leather one. Right, after that bit of knife testing and mm -hmm. farting about, um, it's beer o'clock. Here with Marky. Um, he's got a new toy as well, which I might well show you in a minute. He's got a new tent mm. from a, uh, a manufacturer I've never heard of, but the first impressions, pretty damn good. So I'll, I'll finish this beer and then I might take you over there and show you what he's using. I'm quite impressed. It's my second tent from them. Mm. Right, I'm sorry about the lighting, but I've uh, got the sun shining right on it here. I can't do a lot about that. Um, Hill Zero is the manufacturer. 
Um, I think the name is Matisse or something like that. It's basically a two-man lightweight trekking tent. Sort of thing that you use the walking poles to stand it up with. Um, I've been quite impressed with the amount of space in this thing. Um, I'll have a bit of a walk round. Right, well the sun's actually doing me no favours here whatsoever. Because <laughs> I just can't get the right angle. Um, but yeah, it's a two-man trekking pole tent. If I get sort of like to the back here, you can see at the top here how wide it is. You, you would sleep two in there. You know, it'd be snug, but you could sleep two in there quite easily. For one person and his gear, it'd be brilliant. You've got a nice little vent either end here that actually has a little pole. I don't know if you can see that. A little pole propping it up. That's, it's permanently attached to the pole. You don't have to fit it. Um, the poles are actually carbon fibre, so they're really light. And all of the tent stakes supplied are carbon fibre. So that's uh, pretty impressive. I couldn't believe how bloody light they are. They, they really weigh nothing. Here's the, the vent at the other end. You might see that pole a bit better because of the, the light. But yes, yeah, it, it looks really well thought out. It's, um, you've got a decent size porch or vestibule. Obviously it's, it's a two door one. So there's one either side. I don't know if you can see through there. He's got his, his bag and stuff in that side. And, you know, cooking equipment or whatever over this side at the moment. And in there he's got his, his sleep mat. He's got his sleep mat pushed to one side. And I would say that is uh, 40 centimetres probably. Something like that. Probably 18 inches, that sort of space at least. From the edge of the mat to the door here. So two regular sleep mats would go side by side in there without too much of a problem. Big mesh doors on both sides, which is all going to help with the ventilation. That's uh, yeah, it's quite impressive. I quite like that. Ooh. Right, so Marky's Hill Zero tent. What do we think the name was? Matisse. Matisse, or, or something like Matisse. Um, I quite like it. I'm quite impressed with it. Yeah, I am. And I know you've just looked it up on your phone, so give us all, all the old cobblers. How much does it weigh? 2.6 pound. 2.6 pound. Mm. So... 1.2 kg. I was, just, I was trying to do the maths in the head. <laughs> a bit slow. It's the beer, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. 1.2. For a two-man tent, that's 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 pretty good, isn't it? That, yeah. that, that really is. I suppose in some ways you've got to sort of like bring in the weight of the hiking poles. But there again, if you're doing a hike, you'd possibly yeah, have the poles anyway, wouldn't yeah. you? So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. I quite like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good amount of space. I... I particularly like the height in the middle, the headroom. Oh, you can sit up. In yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd sit yeah. up with plenty of room, wouldn't you, in there? Um, so many tents, like the one I'm using today. It's a great sleeping space, but if you actually want to sit up or get undressed or that sort of thing, it's a bit restricted. Where, where that, you'd have a lot of room. Mm. I'm, I'm quite impressed. Are they silly money? Is, is the next question. You know me, I'm a tight ass. Are, are they stupid money? $259. $259, so that's going to be 200 quid plus, isn't it? Yeah. It's quite a lot of money. But if you're a serious hiker, let, let's face it, um, I mean, the serious hikers tend to be the lightweight fanatics. Ultra light. Don't they? Ultra lights yeah. and all this. And they'll spend 500 quid on a jacket yeah. if it weighs three grams less. So, but, but you've got to remember, it comes with carbon fibre pegs. Carbon fibre ain't cheap. No, no, so, I, I, I'm I'm impressed with the, the pegs and the poles being carbon yeah. fibre. That's that's pretty pretty special. Uh, and, and like I say, if, if you're in the lightweight market, that's the sort of money mm. people spend, aren't they? Um, and I've got close to forty tents now, and none of them apart from that one has got carbon, carbon fibre. Yeah, so, that's probably your lightest tent too, isn't it? 
Yeah, probably is. Probably even yeah, probably even lighter than the Bobcat I've got. Yeah. I, I would think it's roughly the same as my backwards bungalow. It mm. might be a little little bit lighter. Um, yeah, good. I'm impressed with it. I like it. I do. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, and, and I have no no doubts about its waterproofness because I've got the six-person hot You've tank. got the other one, which is the same fabric. Yeah, same yeah. fabric, same cool. manufacturer and that. Held okay. up to some pretty heavy rain. Yep. So. And what was the company name? Something Hills? Hill Zero. Hill Zero. Hill, Hill Zero. Zero. So yeah, yeah, if you want to find out more, Hill Zero. Have, have, have a look. I can always stick a link in the description if you're interested to sort of check their stuff out as well. And get all the information that like two idiots in the woods can't remember. And have to look it up on the phone. And have to look it on the phone, yeah. And he has to <laughs> stick it onto his tripod with post-it notes. Shh, he's not meant to say that. <laughs> The spec for the knife I was looking at, I couldn't remember it all, so I wrote it on a post-it note and I stuck it at the back of the tripod. I can I can never remember it all. Plus, I look at, look it up on my phone because I don't want to get it wrong. Well, exactly, because so, as soon as you do a video like this and you give one piece of information wrong, there's always people in the comments. Yeah. Oh, you didn't say this, or you got that wrong. Actually, so, it weighs this much. Yeah, you were wrong by three grams. Yes. Yeah. There's always them sort of people out there. So we do try to do it correct. Yeah, we do. Never mind. Yeah. We'll finish my beer. As you can see, we're going log cabin style for the fire today. Right, at the bottom we have my fire steel. At the top we have Mark's fire steel. I think he's compensating. <laughs> Ooh, oh, slippery. That was close. Nearly ended up on my arse. Look at the old takeoff point here. We had a deer leap across this little stream. You can see, or at least I hope you can see, where they land that side. And take that track up through there into that section of the woodland. Oh, it's a bit bright. Oh, hang on. Ooh, there we go. Yeah, they got through that way. But the little streams and things like that, always a good place to spot their roots. Because of course they have to launch one side and land quite heavy the other. So in most conditions, there's always prints. Little streams running nicely. That's where we get our water supply from, if we run short of water. You can see the, the track there, or at least I hope you can, where they come down. It's a funny piece of woodland this is, this section here, because it's uh, non-native trees. masses of rhododendron uh, up up through that way yeah, if you used to walk I don't know five minutes you'd find the little bushcraft camp where I normally do solos but this spot here is behind the main camp So it's where the, you hear the deer passing through at night. Bloody carnage in here now. There were so many storms this winter. Big old ash tree just fell through there, right across. 
I just smashed the crap out of that yew tree that was the other side, a little young yew tree. Um, there's the walkway back up to the camp. I don't know if you can just about see my tent there. Up that little walkway that goes back into the camp. Looking through the undergrowth, as it were. There's uh, Mark's tent through there. But everything is, is falling. I'm going to state this big silver birch. That is just hanging up there. There's quite a lot of weight there. Let's not stay underneath that. This used to be quite quite dense in here. <coughs> Excuse me. But with those fallen trees, they sort of like smashed the canopy open. And it's a bit lighter in here now. Not that I suppose the deer bother. This is the route they take. They, they come in in through there. They actually come out um, the dense woodland at the back of the camp, across the edge of our campsite, and then come through here and go round that way. We often often hear them going through at night. That's uh, that's the deer track, as it were. But Mr. Fox, well, he's the other side. Well, you can see quite plainly here the, the path that we take into the woodland. This is uh, this is all us <laughs> um, crossing the ditch. There, we come down through the, that bit of timber there with all the deadfall, and cross this route into into camp. Um, I don't know quite how clear it is on film, but the track there. That's Mr. Fox. Uh, well, the deer might use it as well, but it's fox we normally see. And he comes along here. And him and probably the deer go down across the little stream there and head up into that rhododendron. Um, the fox tends to go that way. The deer tends to go up that way towards the the other camp, the little bushcraft camp. And this fallen tree here is where if there's any leftovers of food, we stick it on, on the end there for the fox to hoover it up. It's, uh, I'll show you, Look, there's camp. You can see, see Mark and his tent sitting there. Uh, we were there last week and Mr. Fox come to about this point, about, about level with this tree. I had my head torch on and I had it on red light and I looked this direction and there was a pair of red eyes looking at me <laughs> and then he he hides back in that rhododendron and, until we've gone quiet or whatever and then he comes back out and and checks the the little tree here if we've left him anything of course there's not always leftovers but if there's ever any bits and pieces we just stick it on that tree and he can hoover it up it's um he's, he's got used to it he knows when we're here I, I, I think you know it's either the noise or potentially he smells the smoke from the fire so he knows we're here and uh you know if there's any leftovers we left it leave it out for him um you can see just about well i can anyway but i'm, I'm used to looking for it um, the track that goes up through there, that's, that's for the deer. Now, I've, I've had in a few previous videos, um, a few people comment about feeding the fox, and um, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, we tend to only put out food that is sensible for him be you know, bits of leftover chicken or that sort of thing nothing nothing stupid so the food's okay but the, the the main concern is a few people have said perhaps you're 
making him more used to people therefore he's more likely to get shot um, because he's not scared of humans anymore well let's uh, let's put that to bed right now firstly he is still scared of humans he comes nowhere near the camp he will come into camp late at night once we've gone to bed you can sometimes hear him um, but generally when we're at camp he doesn't come a 40 or 50 feet closest and then even then he's hiding so uh, yeah so that's not an issue he's he's not uh, tame he hasn't been tamed by our actions um, secondly the, the, the other point is this is a private woodland there is no people in here um, there is no hunting permits or anything like that and I suppose the only person that could shoot in here would be the landowner but as you can see uh, by the state of the woodland they don't really care about this woodland um, I don't think there's any hunting goes on in here I've certainly never found any empty shell casings you know shotgun or rifle unless they're very very efficient at policing their brass um, I don't think anybody hunts in here and I also I get the impression I can't be sure of this but I get the impression seeing the oh, oh, what can I say the location of the house the type of place it is the type of vehicles that are there they're not country folk that do hunting I think they're people that have potentially made money elsewhere probably city folk fancy the country lifestyle and they've got the the money basically to to buy somewhere like this so that's, that's all good news for us because they're basically not interested in the woodland they own it and that's about it so I don't think there's any problem as far as hunting is concerned at least so yeah I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd make that clear for the people that have, have worried you know feeding Mr Fox is it a good idea he's not tame he doesn't come that close there is no one actively shooting in here I'm, I'm pretty certain of that I've been in here hundreds and hundreds of nights even more daytime walking um, I've never seen a soul let alone someone hunting or heard a shot so uh, yeah Mr Fox is pretty safe I think the other thing of course when you see him he's not one of these grey mangy looking bloody um, town foxes should we say urban foxes he's a lovely proper red fox with the whole bushy tail with a white tip like we used to see in children's programs and storybooks certainly when I was a kid he's a proper fox he's living his best life he really is so yeah Mr Fox is pretty safe he's a cool dude and occasionally he gets a treat if there's any leftovers with all that rambling I've uh, I've walked up to the old bushcraft camp this is actually the should we say back door in into that clearing there and this is what what is quite weird let, let me just sort of force my way through here ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm through now an awful lot of my videos you'll see me um, camping with Mark um, we've become good friends we didn't know each other and the bushcraft camp which is essentially behind that tree there is his camp 
he he cleared the undergrowth and, and he made that now just here in this area I won't go right over there but you know between these pines that sort of area I used to camp here quite regularly and I was camping you know stealth camping let's face it we're not meant to be here and he was camping over there and we didn't know about each other which was quite weird and I came back to this campsite uh, one daytime um, it would have been oh look look you see evidence of where someone's had a fire see I never left any shit like that um, I was very very sort of stealthy the way I did it this was the area I was in and I came here one day and the you know lots of evidence of fire there was rubbish all manner of things and I didn't like that. And I thought, bloody hell, someone else has found my campsite. Well, in the bushcraft camp, there was a proper fire pit. With, you know, stones as the backing to it. Uh, and I've got some business cards for my YouTube channel. So I basically left a business card wedged in between the stones. And the next time... Mark came camping, he found it, and he looked me up on Facebook, and <laughs> we've been friends ever since. That was, what, three, four years ago now, and it was quite weird that we've been camping for a while, but only about 100 feet apart, just goes to show. We were both pretty good at hiding. Right, I'm going to try and sort of make my way back in a circular route. Um, I thought I'd show you this. It's, it's very bright out there. I don't know if you can tell. There was a pond. It's very old and all clogged up with fallen trees and all sorts of crap now. And then there's a gully been cut there. And there's actually a, a lower pond down there. That's because many years ago, literally hundreds, Victorian, shall we say, so late 1800s this was part of a very large victorian estate and this was like gardens almost laid out for them <coughs> and that's why there's some very weird trees in here basically um let me just adjust that that's made it a bit brighter like these bloody great firs um, there's redwoods in here. Um, there's even like monkey puzzle trees in here. And it was all stuff that the Victorians imported and planted in their gardens because they, you know, they wanted it. They obviously had the money. Um, if you see the size of the house at this location, um, that'll tell you all about the money. Um, and it was a very popular thing to do during Victorian times. Looks like a deer have been coming through here. Can you see the old tracks? That's the thing, with, with the trees constantly falling in here, because it is unmanaged, and we do have like ash dieback disease in here. The ash trees are coming down all the time. The fir trees, like this one, they're forever falling over because fir trees have got real crappy roots just under the surface nothing impressive and because it's unmanaged it's very dense therefore they grow fast and very tall trying to get to the light so as soon as we get a storm they they fall over not all that clever um can you see here deer trail where the deer go through they do go all round our camping area we don't see them too often they're pretty pretty damn stealthy uh, we hear them at night 
uh, but it's it's not how often you catch a glimpse of them looks like their trail goes this way i'll do the same it's not a big herd although it's a very very large woodland uh, the most i've ever seen together is about sort of 10 or 12. so the the chances of finding 10 or 12 deer in you know 500 plus acres is pretty damn remote right looking into the valley there that area over there up through there um is where i started filming just behind camp um if i was to spin that way our campsite is directly through there through that rhododendron um we're probably within 100 feet or so of camp there uh, there's no evidence of tents or smoke from the fire or anything like that i really do like this woodland it's it's pretty cool there we go very close up my tent you can see marky pots about around the fire and over there between them trees is his tent pretty well hidden really um, this is from close range we're probably five minutes walk to the nearest footpath they're never going to find us well it wasn't forecast but we've just had a little shower and it's dropped a bit cooler as the uh, rain come in um, so I've gone for the smock um, they're not sort of generally waterproof uh, although this one I've treated with a waterproof coating so it keeps the worst off it's not 100% but it's not bad um, and I've got the British Army softy underneath which makes a, a great liner because the smock on its own is not very warm there's not a lot to it but the softy plus the smock together it's not a bad winter jacket actually I didn't think I'll be using it this time of year we should be springtime we should be getting a bit better by now it's actually been lovely during the day but uh, yeah it's dropped a bit chilly it, it certainly it, it came in as that that rain came in a bit of a colder weather front obviously never mind that's what it's all about Oh, that little shower of rain and the water's beading up okay on top of the tent there so i don't have any worries about the, the waterproofing at this moment it doesn't show very well with the just that camera light in me put my head torch on let's have a put it on bright there we go i don't know quite how well that that shows on film but yeah, there's a bit of water on the tent, but hopefully none on the inside. Right, it's bedtime. Um, it's not exactly massive, this tent. But there again, it's a tent for sleeping in as opposed to living in. It's more than enough for just having a kip. Um, the 
porch area it's big enough as i hopefully have caught in the previous shot to stuff my bag one end i've stuffed the fabric off my seat the other end my boots are in the porch and all that sort of thing so nothing mucky is in here with me um all i've got to do is zip up the old bug door outer door's already closed um the only downside that i've found so far there is nowhere inside to hang a light so my light is actually attached to the zip of the bug door which is fine i've had to do that on other tents that's that's no big deal but yeah hopefully good night's kip and i'll uh i'll see you in the morning good night Good morning. It looks like it is a nice morning. A bit cloudy, but it's dry. Birds are singing away. It's still quite early. In fact, it's, it's ten to six. But that's okay. I was really knackered last night, so I went to bed around nine-ish i think it was so it's still like you know, nine hours sleep and it's plenty really oh <sighs> excuse me first thing in the morning um slept well i woke up once just after two-ish uh, bloody deer barking right very close to the edge of the camp here God, he was loud. I went on for about 10 minutes. And then went back to sleep. But, uh, yeah, not bad sleep. And the observation we will make with the tent, into your room and all that, and um, it seemed to like hold its heat quite well. I was very warm. Condensation. Christ. <laughs> Never mind, I sort of expected it. It's a small space to have zipped up, and it's only got little air vents, so I did sort of expect some. But the, this all, uh, the, the inner here is damp. And when I opened the door on the outer fly, bloody hell, I could have made a drink with what was on that. <laughs> Speaking of drink, it must be nearly coffee time. Well, all packed and just walking out. Uh, there's Mr. Mark over that way. Uh, because from this point, he goes that way and I go that way. Yep. But uh, another enjoyable camp. Good fun. Right, very quick summary on the testing. Uh, the Miltech Recon one tent. We did have rain overnight. I stayed dry, that was all fine. I stayed warm, small space. Condensation, epic levels. <laughs> so I think that will be consigned to warmer weather use. But overall, I like it. I like the design and shape and so on. Um, just lots of condensation. Um, my first thoughts, 
um, on that knife, that Polish knife. Overall, I like it. It's pretty beefy, it's pretty tough, but not stupid heavy. One disappointment was that spine being a bit rounded. If it don't work with a fire steel, it don't work for me. Not what I would be using it for anyway. So, the first job when I get back, or at least the next day or so, is I'm going to flatten that spine off and see where we go from there. But uh, overall, I like the knife. So don't let me sort of put you off at this point. Um, because, hey, everyone uses them for different reasons. Um, I just need to tweak it to make it work for me. Right, been so busy talking to the camera, I've come off my normal path. <laughs> if this video is not uploaded for ages, it's because I'm still going round and round in circles in the woods trying to find a way out. <laughs> I'll catch you soon.